Hey guys, before the video starts, we've just opened up a Discord server for the Squash community to talk about production, videos, and music, so if you'd like to join, the link will be in the description and the pinned comment. Thanks, now on to the video. Reaper is one of the new kids on the block when it comes to Dawes. Just like when you have a household full of older brothers, the youngest one tends to get the short end of the stick. However, I think we should give Reaper a fair shake and dive into the history of one of the younger contenders in the music software industry. Most audio workstations were first released or had precursors in the 90s or even earlier, like Cubase and Pro Tools. Contrary to that, Reaper was released in 2006 by the company Kakos. Things were weird in 2006. Twitter had just launched, Enron was on trial for conspiracy and fraud, and we had a spinach-related E. coli outbreak in the States. Anyways, I was always drawn to this program simply because of the name. I mean, it's a kinda badass name for a program. Reaper was originally an acronym for Rapid Environment for Audio Production, Engineering, and Recording. Since it was so late to the party for music software, the original version of Reaper was offered basically for free just to get the name out there and people using it. The developer of Reaper named Justin Frankel decided to start his own company after leaving Nullsoft, which is another company he also founded in 97. His stated goal when creating Reaper was simply to put the user first above all else. This is blatantly apparent in almost every aspect of the program all the way down to its price. Presently, Reaper sells for $225, but you can get a discounted license if you're an individual not using it for commercial use or you're a nonprofit organization. Starting out, it was very bare bones and only came with the essentials and was basically a sandbox for you to work with. I'm not opposed to a program having few stock sounds, but I think that it does make it a lot harder to learn when you have to figure out how to download free third-party plugins and samples, but I digress. More interestingly though, Justin Frankel has a long history of creating things before Reaper, so let's travel back to peer into the doorway of a pre-Reaper Justin Frankel. In his high school years, Justin described himself as programming just for fun. However, the first time he realized his programs could be used for a multitude of purposes and by many people was when he started writing programs for other students to use in his school. His first large-scale project in high school was creating his own local email service for students to send emails to each other during school hours. Interestingly, during this time in his life, he had no real connection to the music industry and was entirely on the programming side of things. It wouldn't be until much later that he decided to pursue music-related endeavors and eventually create Reaper. But before Reaper though, he had created an app called Winamp in 1997, which was one of the earliest media players. His stated reason for creating the program was because the media players before this on Windows did not have the feature list he wanted like creating playlists. He would sell Winamp two years later to AOL for a huge $80 million. These events would eventually lead to Justin working on Reaper in 2005 and releasing it only a year later. The first public release of Reaper came in December 23, 2005. Even before that though, Justin had built prototypes that never saw the light of day, but he does provide screenshots on Reaper's website. Only a couple weeks after his release, it got the ability to load VSTs, which we take for granted now. This version had a pretty capable mixer, automation, multiple tracks, and pretty basic MIDI support. You could see Justin's vision in the first release of wanting to put the consumer above all else. No bells and whistles, just clean and plain what was needed to produce music. Of course this would change over time, but I think he succeeded in sticking true to his original reason for creating Reaper. Many updates would happen very rapidly during the first phase of Reaper, including adding MIDI control surface support, ability to render MP3 files, and the ability to change tempo of your projects with automation. People who started using Reaper early on were fans of its simple approach and the fact that everything loaded so quickly. It received improved reverb algorithm as well as some improvements to its basic MIDI editing window. And lastly, one of the most impressive features would be re-EQ, which was an unlimited band EQ. Looking through the version history, and thank god Justin provides this on the Reaper website, it is sort of insane the amount and frequency of updates he pushed out for this program. We'd only need to wait a measly year for Reaper to get its next large update. Version 2 would be the release that saw some of the most important core additions to Reaper that we all take for granted in DAWs nowadays. We got different modes for elastic pitch, which lets you stretch a sample out without losing quality or tone. And on top of that, Reaper received its own pitch shifting plugin called Repitch to complement its vocal tuning plugin called Retune. This release would also contain a large expansion of the mixer window, making it so you could view your effects and sends more easily. Looking back through images of Reaper at this point versus what it looks like now, it's clear Justin cares deeply about the efficiency and features of Reaper rather than its style. 
It had come into its own by now, and most visual changes would be subtle, as the workflow had been well established. This version would also bring three new plugins which were re-delay, re-voice, and re-vocode. The delay plugin was, as its name suggests, just a plugin to generate delays. Revoice was a pitch shifting plugin for vocal performances that can be controlled with MIDI, and the vocoder was a simple modulation vocoding plugin. During 07 and 08, Reaper saw a huge surge in popularity as it had gained enough features and stock sounds to compete with its peers and was extremely affordable. On top of all that, Reaper was also capable of using its MIDI editor in drum mode so you could attach multiple sounds into one window to create your patterns more easily. One of the other benefits to Reaper was that early on, it was compatible with both Mac and Windows, getting many updates for Mac during this time to remain competitive with Logic. Unlike its older brother FL Studio, who took nearly 20 f***ing years to add Mac support. It's okay FL, I still love you. Anyways, I highly recommend watching the interview that Sonic Scoop did with Justin in 2015, as he gives some insight into his reasoning for wanting to create Reaper and his background with music and software. Only around a year later, we'd see Reaper 3 come out, on May 22, 2009. This was the version that saw many functional updates, like getting separated automation lanes in the playlist and being able to have multiple projects open with tabs. Many improvements would also come to the MIDI editor, allowing you to edit multiple items in one place and being able to edit inline. Visually though, the default theme became much darker and muted, making Reaper look a lot more modern. On top of that, the little Grim Reaper icon was no more, sadly. I kinda like that little guy, but instead we have an old iteration of the current guitar pick-esque icon that was grey instead of coloured. Something I haven't mentioned until now was the fact that Reaper is absurdly lightweight. The entire size of the uncompressed program for version 3 was under 100 megabytes. Something I can definitely appreciate with programs and games getting larger and larger as time goes on. Along with automation lanes, version 3 would also come with the ability to copy and paste automation from different parameters, so you no longer needed to manually edit each one. We'd also get many performance updates to Reaper's sampling plugin called Resamplematic 5000. It's a pretty capable sampler with all of your necessary functions like pitch, attack, or release, although it's definitely not as advanced as something like Alchemy from Logic. Like I had mentioned before, version 3 had many functional updates and most of the stock plugins like EQ, Delay, and Reverb were upgraded to work smoother and better overall. I installed all the versions of Reaper just to see what they were like to use, and by this version Reaper had come into its own and was definitely on its way to becoming a fully stacked DAW. Reaper 4 would come only 2 years after version 3, but something interesting outside the program would also happen, and that was the Reaper blog. This blog would detail the happenings at the time related to the music software industry, Reaper itself, and also included some news posts and tutorials. Part of this blog was also showing off artists who had created music with Reaper to not only give them promo, but to show off what could be done with the software. One of those artists was Camellia, who has a YouTube channel and makes insanely high BPM mishmashes of dubstep, drum and bass, and trap. Apologies if I pronounced the name wrong. Aside from that, version 4 would also receive some new plugins, one of which being ReSurround, which is a digital multi-speaker panning plugin that supported an unlimited number of virtual speakers. This would also mark a point in time where you could create your own themes for Reaper, something I believe other software sorely needs. Thank god FL Studio is adding this in version 21. There's something very freeing about being able to customize the programs you use to your liking and style, just like how people customize their phone screens or desktop backgrounds to be personalized. We'd also see a big improvement to the stem rendering capabilities, which if you're not a producer, stems are each different audio track being rendered out as a separate sound file like WAV or MP3. This is useful because it allows engineers and producers to work on tracks without needing any of the plugins associated with each track since they're baked into the rendered file. Lastly, this version would mark the point at which the Reaper logo would be finalized and still looks like what we see today in version 6. Reaper 5 would come 4 years later on August 12, 2015. Looking through the patch notes of this version, an absurd amount of fixes and performance updates would come along with version 5. If you're at all interested in this type of stuff, I highly recommend going to Reaper's website and looking through their version history along with downloading any old version you want to mess with. The best part, all these old versions are free to download. Anyways, version 5 would be the first time we saw support for VST3 plugins. VST3 is important because it marked a time where VST plugins got a huge performance boost using much less of your computer's resources which works in tandem with Reaper's lightweight approach to music production. They're also more accurate with automation and sample rate, and best of all, allow for resizing of plugins where the interface scales with size. It may not seem like a big deal, but holy sh** does it suck having a tiny plugin on a 4K monitor that can't be changed in size. In terms of new plugins though, we get probably the coolest feature in Reaper, and that's the addition of Super 8. 
Now before we get into what this plugin does, I think it's important to mention something else here. Super 8 is a JS plugin, which is a Reaper native plugin that only works within Reaper, unlike VSTs. All of your JS plugins in Reaper have the option to view the actual code of the plugin written in Rescript and is modifiable. It's pretty insane that you're allowed to modify plugins on the code level for your liking if you know what you're doing. Unfortunately, I have no idea how to write computer code, but still I have not seen this feature in any other DAW. Anyways, Super 8 is essentially a cell-based looping plugin that lets you have 8 different loops within it that can be messed with to your liking. We'd wait another 4 years, and on December 3rd, 2019, Reaper 6 would come out, which is the current version in the modern day. Many upgrades to the stock plugins like Sample-O-Matic, EQ, and Reverb would come along with version 6. All of the user interface now scaled properly, so you could work on non-common resolutions and Reaper would display correctly. It also received some nice updates to the mixer, like being able to horizontally scroll rather than being displayed in its native arrange view, as well as being able to group and label your effects. We'd also see a new way to edit with Reaper's Razor Edit feature that allows you to draw, move, copy, or transform the selected media, whether it's samples, MIDI, or automation envelopes. It was a total blast looking at one of the new kids on the block when it comes to music software. It's so clear to me how much Justin cares about this program, and I would 100% suggest you guys give Reaper a shot if you're into music production or thinking about starting out. It's a super easy DAW to jump into and learn. It's not overly complex. It's not too bare bones. It's sort of like that one fairy tale with Goldilocks and the soup that's just right. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about Reaper with me. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.